Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Film for Fans podcast, your home for movie news, reviews, and movie fan views. This is the home of the podcast from movie fans for movie fans. I am your host, Ryan Dunlevy, joined by the FC Cincinnati jersey wearing Rob Dunham. Yes, with the, if you want to look up FC Cincinnati's logo, it's like the weirdest looking griffin that ever existed. So if you want to laugh, go check it out. How about that? Speaking of laughing, we were trying not to get disturbed by the Zoom recording that now like audibly tells you <laughs> what we were recording, which is kind of disturbing when you first hear it. But we are professional podcasters, so we maintain a straight face. But that is not why you are here. You are here to talk about movies, and we have a fantastic show. Uh, we are going to talk about box office success for A Quiet Place in Cruella. We will briefly discuss the Black Widow trailer. We're going to talk about a supercut of a film I didn't know that I wanted or needed. And I'm looking forward to it. And we will give you a summer movie preview in addition to our watch list. So let's get started here. Um, Rob, let's hit, let's, hit up our, let's hit up our first story. Uh, box office success for A Quiet Place Part 2 and Cruella. Uh, this is one of the best opening weekends. And it looks like we are getting back to normal, starting to get back to normal when it comes to movies. Uh, Quiet Place Part Two opened with 57 million in the box office. Cruella gets 27 million. Uh, these are great performances. And uh, the, the mark that Quiet Place Part Two hit is not that dissimilar from the 60 million uh, that was originally anticipated, anticipated for the three-day pre-pandemic release of A Quiet Place 2. So it's pretty much hitting its mark that they were anticipating pre-pandemic. So that means that in their estimation, it's close to a normal release for A Quiet Place Part 2, which um, is good news. And Cruella did quite well as well, uh, coming in at 27 point that was it 27 yeah i didn't have that 27 we we'll have 27 27 million so rob what did you make of the box office numbers coming out from a quiet place to in cruella well i did see one of the executives said that he could say that this was like without caveat just a good opening weekend yeah it's cool for a quiet place too that it wasn't just a good opening weekend dot 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 because we're in the pandemic. It was a good opening weekend, period. Yeah. Like you said, uh, over four days it made 57, which was only 3 million or less. I think it was the three-day projected amount for pre-pandemic. So you've got to factor in like there's an extra day. There was still pretty, pretty good, solid numbers. And mm -hmm. I also found it interesting. The article said that both movies scored, uh, I believe, A Quiet Place scored an A minus and uh, Cruella scored an A when it came to cinema score, which if you don't know what that is, it's um, they like they pull audiences on the way out of certain showings of movies and then aggregate a score based on what they rate the movie based on a letter scale from A to F. Uh, typically, it seems that movies tend to have a higher score on cinema score than maybe the quality of the movie is sometimes. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that is people just reacting in the moment because I know I'm a prisoner of that at times when you see a movie and you're just like, that was an amazing movie. And then you watch it again. And you're like, maybe not as amazing as I thought. Um, and I think a lot of people might just be reacting to the fact that they haven't been at the theater very often lately. So they might just be excited to see a movie. Uh, but those scores are in, indicative of them both being solid. So I, I think that's a good sign as well. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think it hit the, the convergence of movies people were very much anticipating coming out with higher levels of vaccination, with um, release of some safety uh, measures as things get better. I think that combination all, all went into this. But I think 
it does reveal that people really wanted to go see these movies. They really wanted to go see it. Uh, in particular, A Quiet Place 2. It's been anticipated for a long time. And uh, I think everyone was ready to go back to it. I, I went to see it, we, which we'll talk about later. I went to see it uh, yesterday, actually. And uh, the theater was mostly full. And that was, that was on a Thursday evening, uh, about a week after it originally came out. So that's always a great sign. It's been a long time since I've been into a full theater. I mean, you and I both know we've had experiences where we've been in theaters with two and three people, if that. <laughs> so um, it was it was fun to be back in the theater and fun to be back in a movie that everyone was going to see. Anything else on that one? No, I, th I think those were the main points the article brought out. Just in general, it's a good sign for things, going, especially going into the summer. Mm -hmm. that it's kind of like a foothold for what's going to be coming around the corner yeah and i think it does bode well that we are going to have a good summer at the movies i think the summer box office numbers will be very very good um maybe not quite back to what they've been in pre-pandemic years but will be solid enough to warrant big releases so awesome okay so let's talk a little bit about the the new black widow trailer that came out uh rob did you get a chance to check it out i did um i didn't think there was necessarily like a huge amount of stuff we haven't already seen right it was, it's, it's more of a teaser the the feel was more of a teaser trailer than like a full yes blank like expositional trailer so um i'm just i, I want to see the movie <laughs> <laughs> i feel like i from all, all the different trailers over the last couple of years, I feel like I've seen 90% of the movie. I know that's not true, but it just feels like it. I know. I know. And the fact that they kept delaying it and kept delaying and kept delaying it uh, just drove you nuts. Uh, it does it does show um, a lot of a lot of big action sequences. It does show a lot of interacting with her family. Uh, which is uh, the main crux of the film is her uh, reuniting with her family and doing that. Uh, one thing that I've thought about with these movies, especially since the Avengers movies have, have been a part of it, is how do you craft stories that don't need to involve lots of characters? How can you create craft and create a big movie that you don't feel like, why aren't the other ones here? Um, and I'm, I'm curious as to how they're going to do that with Black Widow, because like I said, the trailer shows a lots of big action sequences, uh, big explosions, big violence, big things of that nature is how, how does that not warrant other characters? So it will be interesting to see, uh, how they craft the story around not needing a bunch of the other Marvel characters. And we're also starting off this phase four of the Marvel movies and by definition, there there will be a few people in there that we know, like Thor and the Guardians of the Galaxy and Black Widow, et cetera. But there's going to be some new people showing up that we have not, never heard of. Yeah. And the question is, are the uh, general audiences going to embrace them the same way? Because I think that that question was asked about the Guardians of the Galaxy before they showed up because no one knew what they were. No one knew, like, why is there a raccoon <laughs> assassin? Yes. Talking raccoon assassin <laughs> and a giant tree. Uh -huh. <laughs> like if you explain that concept to people, they would have thought you were insane. So I Not think to mention, these new characters are going to deal with the same thing. The tree who says, I am Groot over and over <laughs> again is being voiced by Vin Diesel. Yeah. <laughs> I st it still boggles my mind that they went out and got a giant actor to play a tree who has one line. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. And the Guardians of the Galaxy, the characters worked out really well and, and they were fantastic. Uh, it remains to be seen whether the new entrants will be able to hold the same weight and carry the same gravitas as the, uh, as the previous iterations did. But it looks like we are actually going to get Black Widow in a little over a month. So looking forward to it. All right. And now this story, I just had, once I saw this, I had to throw this in here because this just seemed improbable to me and I'm very happy about it and did not know I'd be very happy about it. Uh, our third story 
is Super Mario Brothers fans, this is the 1993 Super Mario Brothers movie, are releasing an extended cut of the original film with 20 minutes of new footage. That's right. Those of you who did not even know there was a Super Mario Brothers movie, there is, and it's getting 20 extra minutes. Um, so fans actually put together the Morton Jankel cut, as they are calling it, based on the husband and wife film directing team that have extended the movie from its original 104 minutes to 125 minutes. Uh, never before seen footage. Um, you have Bob Hoskins as Mario, John Leguizamo as Luigi, uh, Dennis Hopper is in there as Koopa. And this is fantastic. Apparently, they discovered the footage on an old VHS tape and then spent time re-editing it and recompiling it to make it usable footage, which I got to say is, uh, is pretty good work. It's pretty good work for fans. And they're releasing it on Internet Archive. So you can watch it on Internet Archive. Uh, there's a link to it. We'll link to the article. And there is a link in the article for you to be able to watch the movie. Rob, what are your thoughts on a extended cut of Super Mario Brothers? Not sure I feel about the concept as a whole, but the idea that there's now going to be a post-credits rap scene is amazing. <laughs> yes. Because anytime you can get a uh, previously unreleased early 90s post-credit rap scene. Yes. I mean, that's just, that's gold, Jerry. It's gold. It's gold. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love the early 90s rap, man. Yeah. <laughs> so you know it's going to be over the top and ridiculous. I mean, the original movie itself was already over the top and ridiculous. So the fact that we can find more to add on to it will truly only make it more funny to watch. Yeah, and this was, I mean, the early 90s were really kind of the first, the first wave when you started seeing video games used as plot points as as basically as the basis the source material for movies we had the teenage mutant ninja turtles uh movies came out and like the you got the late 80s early 90s where people actually started taking the video games seriously and you started getting a lot of uh movies based on video games and super mario brothers was right in that mix um it's always interesting when you take animated characters and then make them live action and uh, Super Mario Brothers was certain, certainly a take on that fact. Um, whether it was good or not, that, you know, to each his own. Um, but I'm, I'm very pleased with this. Um, I think there's, there's an interesting trend here. I want to get your, your thoughts on fans, fan, basically fan led film cuts. So obviously we've talked extensively about the Snyder cut and now we're getting a fan release of a movie that everyone forgot existed. What do you, is there a future in here is, do you think that there's going to be um, a movement to where fans kind of get versions of films that they want rather than it being a director decides or a studio decides, Hey, let's release something. What do you think? I think we've already seen that in some ways. I know that there's a cut out there of the prequels that does the same thing that um, the person who did it said he was trying to basically eliminate any filler that uh, didn't move the story along and like cut all three movies down, I think like around two hours. Um, so th these kind of efforts have been done before. And I think when you're looking at the broader conception of, like a series it's probably more likely but it's pretty cool that something like this happened where they found this extra footage completely randomly on the CHS because yeah. that doesn't always happen no. um, sometimes it'll happen with regular movies too we talked um, a while ago about uh, the Muppet Christmas Carol where that happened where they found a, a deleted song and added it back into the movie so these kind of things can happen um, from time to time uh, I do think that, like I said, I think with uh, more epic, like longer series type things, you might be more prone to see something like this. Uh, but yeah, I, I think it's an interesting concept for sure. I'm also fascinated 
as to how it gets that some things get director's cuts or extended cuts or altered cuts and some things don't. I think the movie Alexander has been cut nine times just in an attempt to get some version of that film that's actually watchable, which I don't think they've actually succeeded. <laughs> um, but they've the watchable like, cut. <laughs> yeah. And was anyone really demanding this? I think everyone was just like, yeah, that film stinks and then moved on. Yeah. And they kept <laughs> recutting it and kept recutting it and kept doing So I, it's fascinating to me as to what gets cuts and what doesn't. Um, and we'll do an extended piece on that at some point. But Maybe we can have an extended cut of this podcast episode. <laughs> you get secretly found in two years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. We'll have to throw in some extra features. Maybe an extra joke or two. I don't know. <laughs> That's dangerous territory. <laughs> Okay, well, let's uh, we'll we'll put the the Super Mario Brothers cut to bed here. Um, our next story. Let's move on to our discussion. So, our discussion for the episode revolves around summer movies. So now, I think we can say now that we've hit Memorial Day weekend, which is kind of the traditional opening weekend for summer movie season. Now that we've hit Memorial Day weekend. Uh, we are we are at the beginning of summer movie season. So we thought it'd be cool to go through a list of summer movies, uh, a lot of which will be in the box office, some of it are some of which are coming out on streaming services, as to what give you a, like a preview of some films that are coming up that we're excited about, ones we're not excited about, and and some that are underrated. So we will post a, a list. This comes from an article on IGN previewing summer movies uh 32 films to look forward to all right rob i'll give you first crack we'll go back and forth on this let's start with movies we are most anticipating uh so it's off my list and it's not because it's a good movie it's uh, fast and the furious 9 f9 just because yes having, having watched all the rest of them i'm just ready to see a, a new one Ready to see more craziness, ready to see cars with magnets flying off cliffs and being <laughs> caught by more magnets and being repelled by magnets in the middle of a street. And I don't know what else is happening, but uh, people are coming back from the dead. Uh, it's just going to be exciting to see. Yeah. I really, I've, as, as much as uh, the series does get some uh, backlash for not being the best movies, they have done a very it's to their credit, in my opinion, they've done a very good job at establishing a strong, connected, recurring cast, which is not an easy thing to do across that many movies. No. And granted, in like Tokyo Drift, they moved away from that a little bit. But overall, in, in the movies as a whole, there have been these people who keep coming back and back and back. So when you see them in a new one, you're like, yeah, I know that person. Like, I know how he acts. I know how she acts. I know what they're going to say. You know, it's, it is, it's corny, I guess, but it is kind of like, uh, it has a family feel mm -hmm. to the series. You know, whether, whether you think movies are great or not, they've definitely succeeded at having that kind of atmosphere around the cast. Yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this as well. Um, and the return of Han. The return of Han, I can't wait. Um, for me, I'll go with the cliche answer. I'll go with Black Widow uh, for my first one. We've talked, we just talked about that a number of times. Um, but it'll be, it will be good to see a Marvel movie again and to get it, finally get a sense of where they're headed for the next wave. I think this will be an early indicator of what we can expect. So looking forward to that. What else you got? Uh, I guess the other one that jumps out of the list to me is Luca, just because I, I really like animated movies and I really like Pixar. So. I'm, I'm uh, fascinated by the storyline of kids who jump into the water and turn into sea monsters, which is just, it's off the wall, bizarre, and right in line with a lot of things that Pixar has done. And I think the animation and their art style looks pretty phenomenal and a little bit different from what they've done before. So I'm excited to see it. It looks uh, slightly more, I don't, I don't know if you would say realistic because animation tends to not really drive towards realism, but uh, 
in a different vein than a lot of the animation they've done before. So I'm very interested in watching that one that comes out this month. Okay. Uh, for me, my next one, I'm going to go with the Tomorrow War. Uh, this comes out July 2nd on Amazon Prime. Uh, I've been quite critical of streaming service movies. However, this one is a little bit of an exception because this was actually supposed to get a theatrical release and then they moved it to streaming services because of pandemic. I wonder if they would like to have that decision back now. Uh, but this is a movie starring Chris Pratt, Yvonne Strahovski, J.K. Simmons, Betty Gilpin. So it's got a really good cast and it's being directed by the director of the Lego movie and the Lego Batman movie, Chris McKay. Um, and the, the film basically is about soldiers who travel from present day um, into the future to fight against an alien invasion. So I would anticipate this being heavy on the action, light on the plot. Uh, but it will be interesting to see Chris Pratt in something else. It's been a while since he's done other things. Uh, but he's a good actor and I always enjoy him whatever he's doing. Yvonne Strahovski is very good. J.K. Simmons is always good. He's a, he's a highly underrated actor. So we'll see about this one. Um, I wish it were coming out in theaters, but I'll check it out on Amazon Prime. All right. You got, do you got another one, or should we move on to the ones we are not looking forward to? Uh, I didn't know we were doing not looking forward to. I had, I had uh, looking forward to an underrated. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I will start out with ones I am not looking forward to. If you feel like jumping in, you can. Otherwise, sure. I mean, I'll look through the list as you talk. Okay. So the first one I will say I am not looking forward to Space Jam, A New Legacy. <laughs> I got to say, I am not down with this. You don't mess with the original Space Jam. It's not, it's just not going to have the same feel. LeBron is not Michael Jordan. He just isn't. Sorry, not working. Not anticipating it. Nope, not doing it. <laughs> That's my yeah, thoughts on that. I agree with you. Gotta, gotta say I agree with you on that one. Yeah, so no to Space Jam A New Legacy coming out July 16th. Uh, the other one, which I wasn't going to have on my list, but I got added to my list after I saw the original trailer, the initial trailer last night, is The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. Hmm. If that's not a mouthful of a title, geez. Um, this is a sequel to The Hitman's Bodyguard, and it has a great cast. It's got Samuel L. Jackson and Morgan Freeman and Ryan Reynolds and Selma Hayek. Maybe I just don't get it, but it looks dumb. It looks <laughs> super dumb. Sorry, it just does. Um the trailer, uh, when watching the trailer, the action was whatever. The dialogue just seemed ridiculous. It seemed ridiculous. So I am not anticipating the hitman's wife's bodyguard, which comes out June 18th. Yeah, I, I would say uh, I have not watched enough of the trailers to have an opinion either way. In fact, I need to watch the first one because I probably can't should shouldn't develop my full opinion until I see the Hitman's bodyguard, which I, I have, I think, in my Voodoo account for my brother, so I should check that out. Um, I, I don't think there's any here that I'm like, eh, other than uh, Space Jam, they said. But I will say one that's, I'm very much in the middle, I'm not sure how it's going to go, is old. Mm. And I, I'm hesitant about this one and a little worried about this one because I really like M. Night a lot. Yeah, and I feel like uh, with Split, uh, with Split, he kind of did a good job at coming back a little bit, mm -hmm. and so I'm hoping that continues. I'm just not 100% sold on the concept, so I really want to see what he does with it and how it goes. I think it could be really good or really bad, and I'm not sure what it's going to be yet. Yeah, I'll agree with that one. All right, so what do you got for uh, what do you got for un underrated? Or uh, uh, how I worded uh, that underrated? Yes. Uh, the first one I've got is In the Heights, which is uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda's first musical. Uh, mm -hmm. Music he did before Hamilton. It won uh, several Tony Awards on Broadway. Um, 
stars a couple of people who actually were in Hamilton as well. And it's a film adaptation. It's, so it, instead of Hamilton, where it was like a straight from the stage thing, this is more of a filmed version. I guess you could think of it like a West Side Story kind of uh, adaptation of a play to film, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's his story about uh, a young bodega owner who's trying to uh, pull himself out of where he is and get in. And it's called In the Heights because it's set in Brooklyn Heights. Um, which is where Lynn Manuel is from, that area. Uh, so I'm very excited to see that because I, I like Lynn Manuel Miranda a lot. I like his style, I like his music, and he wrote the music for this as well. Um, I'll just go ahead and go. My my other uh, underrated one is Free Guy, starring Ryan Reynolds, mm. which I think I, I've been on my radar since I first heard it came out, just because the concept to me makes a lot of sense with Ryan Reynolds being the person in it, a guy who wakes up and realizes after a little while that he's actually a non-player controlled character in a video game. And all this crazy stuff is happening around him and he's trying to figure out why the world has gone insane. And I think that he's just the perfect person to play that kind of role. And I think he'll provide like levity and really good sense of humor to it. So Free Guy uh, is one another one I'm looking forward to that I think will, will probably not be like a massive success, will probably be underrated. Yeah, I agree with that one. That one would be on my list too. Um, I saw the trailer for this a long time ago, like you did. And the concept seems really unique and really original. And there's a lot you could potentially do with this that will be different and interesting. My one concern is that it's not necessarily a concern is, are we burning out Ryan Reynolds, uh, <laughs> the Ryan Reynolds character? Uh, is is there a point at which that that's that's going to no longer work his his shtick? Uh, is is there a point at which we can no longer just plop the Ryan Reynolds character into that and have it work? <laughs> I mean, so far it appears to me that there's really not anyone else who can play the Ryan Reynolds character. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess he's true. the only person who can do it. He's the person that's going to get hired. That's true. Uh, but yeah, no, it does look really good. And I, I anticipate not enough people know about that one. So hopefully we'll get the word out on that one. Um, the, the second one for me would be The Ice Road for, on Netflix. This is a Liam Neeson movie, which tells you all you need to know about it because it's a Liam Neeson movie. However, the one thing about Liam Neeson movies is you know what, you know what to get, you know what you're going to expect. And he delivers. And there's something, there's something nice about that. There's something good about that. Um, this is uh, basically, it revolves around a seemingly impossible rescue mission of trapped miners in the Canadian wilderness. Uh, this also stars, stars uh, Lawrence Fisher, Fishburne and Holt McElhaney. I keep having problems saying that name, Holt McElhaney. It seems like it should be Colt. Yeah, I keep, I keep wanting to mess that up. Uh, but it's also being directed by the writer of a bunch of good 90s movies. Um, Jumanji, Die Hard, The Vengeance, Armageddon, uh, Jonathan Hensley. Hmm. So I think it's got potential. I mean, like I said, Netflix movies, you're not expecting greatness. But I think I think it's got potential. I think it could be I think it could be worth a watch. So that that's the wraps up my list of potentially underrated. That's I think we have established over the last couple months as I've watched many Liam Neeson action movies that you're not really watching a Liam Neeson action movie for greatness no. <laughs> to begin with. So <laughs> no, you aren't. But there's there's something reliable about Liam Neeson, and I think that's there's there's benefits to that for sure. All right. Well, that will wrap up our summer movie preview. There's a lot coming out. Uh, check out the article about some of the other movies that are coming out and um, make a plan to go see a, a number of these in the movie theaters. OK, uh, so let's go to our watch list. These are movies that we watched over the past week. Uh, we will give you a brief synopsis of the movie and what we thought about it. Uh, Rob, let's let's have you go first on this one. Uh, well, I watched three very different movies. I'm looking at what I watched. 
Uh, the first one I watched was Battle of Los Angeles, mm. uh, starring Aaron Eckhart, which is uh, basically about an alien invasion where the aliens are trying to siphon off the Earth's water supply, and they kind of attack out of nowhere. Originally, people think that it's meteors that are going to hit the Earth, but it turns out to be aliens, and we don't know how to kill them or how to stop them, and they eventually figure that out, and then it's kind of just like absolute chaos. And Aaron Eckhart plays a uh, Marine uh, higher up in rank who is deciding to leave uh, the military. And like the day, the day that I retire, they pull me back in, you know, the classic, uh, <laughs> classic trope, they're doing exercises and his boss says, you need to go with these people because they need you to lead them. Okay. And uh, does have some interesting emotional subplots the one person under his command is a brother of someone who had previously been under his command who had died in action so that's a whole thing that goes on throughout the movie and um it's it's not a great movie but it's a slightly different take on the alien invasion movie so i appreciate it but i, I didn't think it was great um uh, another one i watched was blue streak starring mm -hmm. martin lawrence which about as different from that movie as you could get yeah for sure <laughs> uh 90s uh comedy 90s r-rated comedies if you've ever watched 90s r-rated comedy you know exactly what you're going to get a lot mm -hmm. of swearing um a lot of needless violence and just absolute absurdity uh luke wilson plays the uh his his co-worker in the police station although martin lawrence is not actually a police officer he just goes in and pretends to be one and ends up infiltrating the entire police department. He's actually a thief. And has a very interesting ending that when it ended, I looked at my wife and said, there's no way that would ever happen in real life. <laughs> that's that's yeah. 90s comedy for you. It doesn't have to make sense. It just has to make you laugh. That's right. Um, and then the other one I watched, as I said, these three movies are all different from each other. This is The Cutting Edge from 1992, which oh, okay. is a movie, if you've never seen, uh, this is one of my wife's favorite movies, so my wife recommends The Cutting Edge, and I actually thought it was pretty good, so to be fair. Um, it's about a figure skater who has been to the Olympics and failed and is frustrated, and she's thinking of giving up because every partner that she has is no good. And uh, there's a hockey player who gets injured in a hockey game and can't play anymore. He basically gets slammed to the boards and has issues with peripheral vision that will limit him from being able to play hockey again. And they go out and scout him and have him come in to be her partner, someone who has only played ice hockey, never figure skated before. So again, realistic nature of the movie, not super high probably, but it is funny and it's heartwarming. And uh, my, my biggest issue with this movie, if you have not seen it, my wife said it's explained in the sequel. The, the entire movie is leading up to this. This is a spoiler alert, so if you have not seen The Cutting Edge, it's tough. Um, <laughs> it's, it's leading up to this end scene at the Olympics, and they show their whole Olympics routine, and then it goes black to the credits, and it doesn't show you what happened. So did they win? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and the sequel was a long time later, if I'm not. Yeah, it was, it was, I think, like nine years later or something. And it's yeah. like, uh, so the so you're telling me that the entire point of the movie, you're not going to tell me what the answer was. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that made me a little upset. But overall, I thought it was a good movie. I thought the acting was pretty solid in it. And definitely for an early 90s uh, romantic comedy, if you want to classify it as that, it's pretty quality. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so I also watched, um, I also watched three movies and they were also a little bit different. Uh, the first one I watched was Jurassic Park 3. This came out in 2001 and the plot of the movie, aside from dinosaurs eating people, is a, a boy and his mother's boyfriend, I guess. Uh, go on parasailing trip near uh, the B site, site B, which you found out more about in Jurassic Park, The Lost World. Uh, a boat 
you know, something happens, boat gets destroyed, they end up stranded on the island. And so then the parents of this boy team up to basically manipulate Sam Neill into coming back to the island. He was supposed to just be giving them a tour as they flew over, they landed the plane, and the rest is history. Uh, this was probably the weakest installment in the Jurassic Park series. Really, the only thing it adds to is they re the return of Sam Neill. Basically, that's about all you get out of this film. I mean, you get you get the classic dinosaur versus human action sequences. It's not a bad movie by any stretch, uh, but would this series be any different if this movie didn't exist? No, no, it really would. Uh, so I think it was basically just, hey, we get Sam Neill back. And we got Malcolm. Now we get Sam Neill back. Eh, so, I mean, it's not a, it's not a bad movie, but it's, it's, it's nothing to write home about. Um, the second one I watched was Dead Poet Society from 1989. It's a classic film. Um, Robert Sean Leonard, who is of, of house fame, uh, was the one is one of the main stars, Ethan Hawke, and of course, Robin Williams. And Robin Williams was excellent in this movie, as Robin Williams really was a really, really good actor, uh, playing a lot of different serious roles. Uh, but this is this is it's a really, really good movie. It's, it's an incredible movie about the power of teaching. Um, about, you know, how we think how we act. Um, I will say that my one, my kind of one beef with the movie is, um, and again, this, we get into a little bit of spoilers here, is they place a lot of the blame, almost, they place exclusively the blame on the father. And I do think Robin Williams' character should share a little bit of the blame in this one. They set it up as Rob Williams is the innocent scapegoat and the father is the is the big evil character completely responsible for everything. I think that's mostly true, but not entirely true. I think it could be made, the case could be made that Rob Williams uh, set in motion things that, that, that his students were not necessarily emotionally mature enough to be able to handle. Mm. So. Just, just some thoughts on that. What, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I have to say I agree with that. I think that his character is someone who wanted to broaden their horizons and push them and may not have been prepared for exactly where they were going to go when they got pushed. Um, obviously, he, he is a force of will that these kids rally around. Mm -hmm. Uh, anytime you have someone in that kind of role, any kind of leadership role, uh, you don't always know exactly how people will react to that or how they will respond emotionally to it. So I, 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 I haven't really had that discussion with people before, but I can see certainly why that, um, why that argument would be made and it makes sense yeah. to me. And like you said, I also think it should be emphasized that Robin Williams was a phenomenal actor because a lot of people just think of him as funny haha -ha guy but he was uh, he was an incredible talent um and it is it is a shame you know that he he left when he did because i i really think there was a lot more he could have done yeah yeah so if you have not seen dead poet society that is a must watch um the last one I saw was A Quiet Place Part 2. Now, if I'm not mistaken, you have not seen it yet, right? I've not seen it yet. Okay. So I will limit my comments to just my observations from it. Uh, the, first, the first thing that's fascinating about it is this is one of the reasons why you want to go see this in theaters. The theater experience for this movie is different than most other theater experiences you're going to have. Because the movie is so quiet, um, as if you're not familiar, the main plot is aliens come up, invade the earth, killing everybody, and they're extremely sensitive to sound. So they will come kill you if they hear any noise. So all the humans who are around uh, need to be quiet. Um, now, 
the what this means in practice is when you're sitting in the theaters and there are all these quiet scenes, no background music, very little noise, you feel like you can't move. You feel like you can't do anything because any squeak you make is super intrusive. It's really obvious. Like you're not wanting to grab popcorn. You're not wanting to take a sip of your drink. The theater is dead quiet and any motion anyone makes kind of is a disruptive element. So it creates a very, very interesting theater atmosphere. As for the movie itself, I thought it was really well done. I thought it was an excellent addition, a great sequel. It spends basically the first 10 minutes of the movie on day one, what happened during the invasion. The rest of the movie takes place uh, post the first movie. Uh, there are some really, really cool directorial choices in this. There's one scene where the three main characters are all separated. And John Krasinski, who directs it, does a basically hopping back and forth between each one of, of their scenes. And all of them are approaching a, a, peer, a point of peril. And so how he juxtaposed all three of those uh, and keeps cutting back and forth between all three of them, it was really, really well done. And it really maintained, it's difficult to maintain a heightened level of tension on three different storylines simultaneously. And he did a really good job of that. Uh, they certainly left open uh, for a third movie, which I'm anticipating they're definitely going to do. And I believe, I think it might even report it, they're definitely doing it. Uh, well worth, well worth going out. Uh, Emily Blunt's performance is excellent. The daughter at, does really well, but I think the son, uh, the son was the standout, was a standout performance in this one. I think mm -hmm. he really, really made his mark on this film in a way that he did not in the first film and, and was a really surprising performance. Cillian Murphy is also in this and does well also. And the box office response would seem to indicate that uh, there will definitely be another one. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, definitely go out and see A Quiet Place Part 2. Okay. Now, in honor of A Quiet Place Part 2, an Emily Blunt starring role, we thought for our recommendations as we close out the show, our recommendations for tonight were recommend an Emily Blunt movie. So, Rob, what Emily Blunt movie are you going to recommend that people see? So there are like several Emily Blunt movies that are very popular that a lot of people know, like A Quiet Place and Edge of Tomorrow and other ones like that. And I think we decided we were going to go off the board a little bit when it came to recommendations because we, we want to recommend movies for everyone to watch to broaden their horizons too, not necessarily just to watch what um, is popular, everyone has seen. And so for me, I, I was looking through the list and one that popped out to me, and to be honest, um, when I had seen it, I don't think I really knew who Emily Blunt was, not certainly not in the same way that I do now. So when I watched it, I was watching it mainly because Ewan McGregor was in it, I knew who he was. Mm. Um, but there's a movie from 2011 called Salmon Fishing in the Yemen, starring Ewan McGregor and Emily Blunt. And uh, Ewan McGregor's character is hired basically to bring salmon fishing to a rich sheik's property because he wants to be able to fish because he likes fishing and he wants to be able to do it where he lives instead of having to fly all over the world every time he does. And their interaction is based around the ability and um, actual possibility of making this reality. And I believe, now I've only seen this movie once and it was a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe there is some uh, love interest action in this movie between them as well. Um, and I do remember being a uh, very heartwarming and uh, positive movie. So salmon fishing in the Yemen, I would recommend. Um, so I'm going to give you 1.5 recommendations on this one. Uh, the first movie I can remember, it might not have been the first one I actually saw her in, but the first one I remember seeing her in was Dan in real life. Uh, the Steve Carroll uh, comedy drama at which he accidentally, well, he gets set up with a girl who 
the last thing they can remember was her being uh, ugly. And then he gets set up on a blind date with her and it turns out it's Emily Blunt and mm. he's all into it. Uh, that's the first movie I remember seeing Emily Blunt to, Dan in Real Life. It's a really good one. Uh, but the one I'm actually going to recommend is The Devil Wears Prada. And this may seem like a, a weird recommendation, but it's actually a really good movie. Uh, Emily Blunt plays the snooty uh, first assistant to Miranda Priestley, who is a fashion icon, who's like the head of the fashion world. And Anne Hathaway plays the new secondary assistant. And so Emily Blunt has this role where she is this uptight, snooty English fashion uh, assistant and she's she's really she's really endearing in that role and really fun and it's actually a it's actually a really good movie it, there's a lot of character development in it it really talks about how when you envelop yourself into a world how it actually changes you and i i've seen that in my own life and in my own jobs the jobs that i have end up having an impact i worked at sunglass hut for a number of years and consequently, I have like 15 pairs of sunglasses and I knew all this stuff about sunglasses. Um, it's just the random stuff you pick up on, but there's, there's ways in which the jobs that you have impact your life. And this movie does a great job of showing that as well as uh, having to make decisions about the type of life you want, what you're willing to put up with, what you're willing to do, what you're willing to work for. So there's actually a lot of development in this film. Okay. Well, that is the show, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Film for Fans. If you like this show, share it with your friends. We'd love to have the more fans, as well as uh, make sure you rate, subscribe, send us messages. We'd love to hear from you. Send us comments on whatever platform you're on. And until next time, enjoy the movies. <laughs>